I'm always delighted to be at Herne Bay Baptist Church. And so as we share together God's word this morning, I, I can tell you what a pleasure it is for me to be with you. Uh, sadly, not physically, uh, but remotely, digitally in this form. We're all um, sadly getting used to uh, quite quickly uh, during these months of lockdown. Uh, I was actually, as many of you will know, in Herne Bay uh, at the church in the 1970s. Uh, now, I know that many of you are saying to yourself, he can't possibly be old enough to have been in ministry in the 1970s. Well, you're right. But I was very young when I came to Herne Bay and I found myself wonderfully cared for and looked after by the church. And my responsibility was largely among young people. Uh, and I'm delighted to be back in Herne Bay uh, sharing this word with you this morning. I want us to look at a passage in the Old Testament uh, to reflect together on being the people of God and having confidence in God in these very strange times. Different people are coping with lockdown in different ways, aren't they? Some people uh, are genuinely okay with it all. Um, I had an email this week uh, from someone who's actually coping particularly well. They have a very nice home, they have plenty of garden space, um, they have family in the home, and they're quite introverted, so they don't really miss going out very much at all. On the other hand, I get correspondence from church leaders, from church members, deeply distressed about lockdown, very anxious about uh, whether they can go out or not and who they can mix with, some older people really frustrated at not having an intimate and good relationship with their children and grandchildren and feeling very frustrated. Um, so there are people at every spectrum of this whole process, fearful, sad, nervous, bold, frustrated, wanting to get out and even encouraging civil disobedience. So there's, there's all sorts of views and uh, perhaps at Herne Bay, all those views will be represented. What we know is we've got to go into the future as a church family and as Christian believers. We're the kind of people who say we believe the Bible's God's word and we believe that we're followers of Jesus Christ. We've come to the point in our lives when we've said yes to Jesus. We've invited him to come and live within us and transform our lives and be our partner through life. So when we view our newspaper or the television, or the internet news, we view it with a lens, and the lens through which we look is the lens of our Christian faith. So we ought to be looking at life on planet Earth in 2020 with all its strangeness through the lens of the Bible and through the lens of knowing Jesus. So we should be those who look with confidence to the future, not because we control it, we certainly don't, not even because our politicians whom we might trust control it because they don't, but because we trust in God. So our passage is from the book of Chronicles. Let me read you a few verses. It's from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 20. It's a story about Jehoshaphat. Now, the story is one of wonderful victory against overwhelming odds. Uh, not a virus, not a lockdown, uh, but an army. Uh, 2 Chronicles 20 begins like this. After this... The Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Munites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. So that's the scene, Jehoshaphat, this great servant of God, representative of the people of Israel. Uh, and the enemies are coming for him and for his people. And then verse 2 tells us that uh, it's a vast army coming against you. Uh, and they're coming from the other side of the Dead Sea. Uh, and they're already in En Gedi, which is across the Dead Sea see from Edom. Now I've been to En Gedi, it's, it's beautiful, lush, quite the opposite of the Dead Sea, although it's just a mile or two away from it. Um, the Dead Sea, of course, dead, salty, no fish, no life. En Gedi's a spring with fresh water uh, where troops would often gather to refresh themselves. Uh, David himself, King David, uh, found it a really useful, refreshing place for himself in some of his regular skirmishes with King Saul. So this army is refreshing itself at the spring in Engedi and getting ready for war. And Jehoshaphat is becoming increasingly nervous at this, quote, vast army that is approaching him. 
So 2 Chronicles chapter 20 uh, reveals all these things uh, in terms of a prayer. Here's the prayer. Lord God of our ancestors, you are not, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms and all the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Now, that's a very good way to start any prayer. It's a reminder that God is in charge of the nations of the world. Now, let's just pause there as we think about Jehoshaphat this morning. Let's just pause. Our God is greater than all the nations of the world and all the powers ranged against us. That's hard to believe sometimes, isn't it? Because it looks like this virus, COVID-19, is dominating not just our country, but the political situation in the entire world. For once, someone talking about a global issue really is talking about a global issue. All the races, all the nationalities, all the language groups. Of course, some nations more affected than others, but this is genuinely a global pandemic. And most nations have chosen to lock down as a result of it. And so we're facing huge constrictions on our personal freedom, on our way of life, on our way of thinking, on our access to the health service, on our capacity to work, on our capacity to retain a job if we have one, on our children's schooling and on and on and on. We, we know it's vast. Is God bigger than all that? Has God been taken by surprise by all that's gone on? No. We can't always see God at work. We can't always sense where his hand is or isn't. But this prayer puts us in the right place. God is bigger than it all. God's more powerful than it all. And God is able to defeat any enemy of the human race and any of his enemies. So that's a pretty important place to begin because it's faith building. It reminds us to focus primarily not on the problems of the pandemic, not on the logic of lockdown pressure, not, not there. We're inevitably obsessed by that. Every news bulletin, every newspaper front page, every internet breaking story. Is there anything else on the news? Two or three years ago, you'd have been forgiving, forgiven for understanding that the only news item in Britain was about Brexit. Nothing else seemed to dominate the airways. Now, Brexit's been replaced by another obsession, an obsession with a virus and the lockdown which governments have chosen to impose as their antidote to this virus. So that dominates the airways, the time, our attention, everybody talks about it. So our job as Christians is to let God dominate our perceptions, to make sure that we give the Bible, God and his power, our attention in prayer to him so that our perspective is an appropriate one. Because if all we do is see fearful and often hysterical reports in the media, that will build fear in our lives, that will build in all of us, a growing sense of anxiety if we're not careful. And then instead of thinking about what the true risks might be towards us and our health, we exaggerate those risks and we become fearful and see the virus everywhere, even where it isn't. It's worth remembering that in the last week or two, with growing virus reports, uh, that only 1.5% of all deaths in the UK have been related to COVID. And just think about that, 1.5%, that's all. So we've got to see this risk in proportion, keep the thing in perspective. Most of us are in very, very, very little risk of catching the virus and even less risk of it being problematic. Now, for some vulnerable people, for some older people, for some people who are already struggling with health conditions, it certainly is more risky and more dangerous. Uh, but we have to keep this as a population in perspective. How do we do that? Well, by genuinely thinking about what the real risk is, not, not the hysterical risk which the media keep presenting to us, but also by getting our focus on God, as Jehoshaphat does, 
at the beginning of this prayer. And then as 2 Chronicles unfolds, you see the prayer um, develop. It, it talks about God being the God of Abraham, the God of the past, the reminder that God's been faithful. Some older people, my parents' generation, uh, vaguely remember the Second World War. My grandparents remembered it vividly. They were frightened. My grandmother uh, was living very close to London with all the bombing and the blitz that went on. She had experience of God protecting and caring in her past. And so the people of God, through Abraham and the reference here, had experience of a God who'd been faithful historically, not just a God they were hoping was going to be faithful in the future. And then verse 10 says, but all these enemies are coming and, and gosh, we're frightened. Look, we, we helped them, verse 11, in the past. The children of Israel have been kind to the Edomites and apparently that's not being repaid in kind. Uh, our God, verse 12, will you not judge them? And then this prayer which we can make our own today at the end of Jehoshaphat's prayer. Verse 12. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And then this lovely little phrase to follow. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. What a great reminder that the whole church family, our babies, our children, our young people, middle-aged, the elderly, everybody, can stand before the Lord and receive his help. So notice what Jehoshaphat says. We haven't got any power and we don't know what to do. That's the guts of verse 12. We haven't got any power. I think most of us have been reminded by uh, COVID-19 and the subsequent lockdown how little power the human race has. It would have been easy to fool ourselves to believe that we've got great power. Surely we've done amazing things in the 20th and the first part of the 20th century. We've discovered nuclear power, cures for all sorts of diseases, uh, mechanism has been uh, widely rolled out, the internet, uh, the Gosh, the connectivity of the world. What an amazing human race we are. But into this hubristic, arrogant attitude, we've been reminded that an invisible, microscopically small virus has rendered the world impotent, powerless and afraid. And the greatest governments, the, the most powerful economies have all struggled to deal with it. They don't have the power to work it out. However sophisticated we think we are, however clever our scientists and medics, we have no power to face this enemy. That's actually good for our humility as a nation and a world. And it's good for us as individuals too, to realise that we are not necessarily as powerful as we might have thought we were. So humility is a good thing and it's a good place to start. But here's the confidence, faith-building thing in an admission of that powerlessness. Jehoshaphat prayer goes on in verse 12. We do not know what to do. What, what a simple, straightforward, honest admission. Um, sometimes there's a lot of pretense in the life of the church. We pretend that we're happier than we are. We pretend that we're more full of faith than we are sometimes. We pretend that we've got it all together in our lives. And truthfully, we don't have it very much together at all. I love the honesty of this phrase. We do well to copy it. We do not know what to do. The cleverest mind, the richest human the most informed scientist, the most astute medic. We're all groping a bit in the dark here in handling this pandemic. So we don't know what to do. But this is where our Christian faith comes in so strongly, so clearly, so dynamically. Our eyes are on you. Who, who are we looking at? Who are we looking at? 
Uh, I remember some years ago that uh, my wife and I, with uh, our son, who was, um, I guess, five or six or seven years of age, a young boy at the time, uh, made our way to Northern Ireland. I was speaking at a conference there, and uh, there was a day off one afternoon, and the three of us went to a small island off the North Antrim coast. It's linked to the mainland by a relatively short rope bridge. Uh, when we got to it, uh, uh, my wife, bold as anything, walked straight across this ratchety bridge, leaving me and our son at the other side. When Sam, our son, started to step across the bridge, he froze on the first wooden slat. Looking down at the waves crashing into the rocks below, hundreds of feet below, he was terrified and he just couldn't take another step. So we were in a bit of a pickle because we wanted to go to the island and mum was on one side and I was on the other with him. And so I said to him, Sam, don't look down. I'll be walking right behind you and I want you to just look at your mum. And don't look down, don't look at the way, don't look anywhere else, just look at mum and she'll be smiling at you and calling you across. Now ready, take a step, I'm right behind you. And all the way across, I kept saying, now look at mum, look at mum, look at mum. And he kept, I saw him, his eyes were fixed in the kind of manic stare on his mum the other side as gingerly he stepped across all these rickety wooden slats to get to the other side. And he made it across because he stared relentlessly at his mum, a source of encouragement. He didn't look down at the waves, he looked at her. Now, of course, once we got to the other side, I realised, having congratulated myself on how clever I was to get my son over there, that now I'd got to do the whole thing in reverse when we got off the island. But anyway, we did the same thing on the way back. Here's the thing. He did that task by not looking at the waves and the huge distance below and the rocks, but looking at his mum and the confidence she gave him. And so I want to encourage you, if you're feeling lonely, because you're so socially distanced from your neighbours and family, you hardly see anybody, or you're feeling afraid, or you're wondering what the future will hold for the church, or for your family, or for your work, not to spend too much time looking at the problems and the wreckage and the challenges. They're real, of course, but not to gaze at them perpetually, but to look into the eyes of the God who cares for you, and who loves you, and who is walking with you. The God who said in the New Testament, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's hard, isn't it, for us to feel God's presence at times, because um, we feel the more immediate news and the pressure around us, and we feel our own loneliness and isolation. So I want to urge you and encourage you this morning not to focus on the vast army which we are all grappling with, but to focus on the one who is above all that. To focus on the one who does know the future, the post-Covid future, who does love us and walk with us, who encourages us to fix our eyes on him. Some of you will know the New Testament verse that echoes that, which says, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. It's in the book of Hebrews. We thank God for that fixation to fix our eyes on him. So today, in concerns and worries and anxieties, um, insecurities of a range of kinds, which many of us feel, I encourage you to enjoy the story of 2 Chronicles 20, to learn from the faith of Jehoshaphat, and to say to yourself, it's a vast army, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are fixed on him. God bless you today.